<laughs> turn around, boy, I'll tell you, turn around. Because it was, it was really dark. I, I just didn't know how to handle what was happening in my life. And I know that that's true for many, many other people. And I hope you get through your life and you never have the rug pulled out like that, uh, where you're just completely clueless on, on how to move forward. But the good news is, even if that does happen, that God is still there for you and that you can always turn to him. And I really am very highly convicted that if I didn't turn to the Lord, I probably, uh, in, in all the ways I was trying to medicate my pain, I probably would have ended up dying. And, uh, you know, I'm just grateful every day is a gift because without him, I don't think I'd be alive. So pretty good. That, that's a good reason to stay excited and to keep my mind on the eternal perspective, not on the casual problems that we all deal with every day. But, you know, it doesn't mean you don't still get upset, but we have this compass pointing to true north and reminding us that no pit is too deep for him to reach his hand down and, and pull somebody out. I know that's true. I know that's true. And I'm going to be his hands and his feet on the earth while I'm alive and try to be an ambassador for him, and I hope you will too. So the, the title the Lord gave me tonight is The Sun Eclipsed the Darkness of Death. Can you say that with me? The sun eclipsed the darkness of death, and I'll try to unpack that a little bit for you. Um, many of you know the verse in Romans that says, where sin abounds, finish it for me, grace, all right, does even more abound. So this is going to be an expanded version of those verses that really struck home to me. So, Lord, we just ask you as we open up your word tonight that our, our lives would be awakened by the truth that we find in here. I, I love what Jesus said that when they asked him where he got the food from, he said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. So I pray that we would have that same heart, that, that we would receive nourishment from hearing your word tonight, and that it would transform us, that our minds would be renewed by the truth of your word in Jesus' name. Anybody else have that happen where your mind was renewed as you studied the word of God? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? All right, so this is how it says it in the voice message, uh, sorry, the voice version, Romans 5.20, wherever sin grew and spread, God's grace was there in fuller, greater measure. No matter how much sin crept in, there was always more grace. No matter how much sin crept in, there was always more grace. That really encourages me. In the same way that sin reigned in the sphere of death, now grace reigns through God's restorative justice. There's the word here, eclipsing death. I had never seen it that way before. And it made so much sense to me. It's not that death goes away. We're still in a world that has death because Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And if you get a chance, go on our YouTube channel and listen to a message by Isaac Petrie. It says, God's, God raises dead spirits back to life. It's amazing. It's a one-hour message. I highly recommend it. I can't do it justice right now, but I'm just telling you that he does such a great teaching all the way from the garden, all the way to Jesus dying, but also going down into hell to take the keys of death and hell away from the devil. The insight he has on that is just amazing. So it's not that death doesn't still exist, but we now have life inside of us that eclipses the death. Because we know, as they did in the early church, no matter what people try to do to you in this life, does not compare to the resurrected body and eternal ruling and reigning that we're going to have with Jesus Christ. And that's something to be really excited about. These light and momentary afflictions don't compare to the glory that's going to be revealed through us and in us for eternity. That's exciting to me. So even though sin reigned in the sphere of death, now grace reigns through God's restorative justice, eclipsing death and leading to eternal life through the anointed one, Jesus, our Lord, the liberating king. Has anybody else known him to be a liberating king? He's the chain breaker. He's the one that sets the captives free. I came to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up their wounds. I came to take keys to the prison cell and open that door and let people out of that prison of sin. 
So that's what it's called, the sun eclipse, the darkness of death. And I wanted to have some kind of picture to show it. So most of us have heard this verse from Romans chapter 6, verse 3, the wages of sin is death. And again, you, you might not think that it's literal death, it's spiritual death, the way it's being referred to here, but it, it does also lead to physical death many times. So the wages of the devil, when you work for the kingdom of darkness, you, you have dead relationships. You have dead dead ends in your life because you lie and you cheat and you steal. I know I'm not the only one in here that lived that way. And when you're, when you're dealing drugs and you're, and you're living that life, you just justify it in your own mind. But it leads to death. Maybe not physically, but certainly of relationships and trust. And so many things get violated. So then, here's the eclipse. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ. So it's not that there's not darkness there, but the the darkness is eclipsed by the sun. Amen? That's who's inside of us right now. If you're happy about that, you should get excited because he's inside of us, and that light shines out from us. What does the devil try to do? Get you away, get you out of the word, get you out of fellowship with other believers, get you thinking about all your problems all the time. What you say inside is what you start to believe in your heart. If you meditate on the word, you get renewed. If you meditate on the problems, you get stewed. <laughs> I'm not going to try to be a rapper here, I promise. I wanted to just say, you're welcome. <laughs> Genesis 32 is a really important part of scripture, and I put up here, we all are wrestling with God. And if you know the reference here, this is where Jacob is waiting to meet his brother Esau, and if you know the story, he's got a lot of reasons to be worried, doesn't he? Because he thinks Esau is going to want to kill him and try to kill him. So he comes up with a plan. He brings a bunch of, of his goods to, to meet his brother. And he sends the, the, the herds out in front of him. And I'll start there in verse 16 of Genesis 32. It says, Jacob said, go ahead of me to the people leading his his tribe there, and keep a healthy space between each herd. So he had brought multiple herds to give to his brother Esau. And then he instructed the first one out and said, when my brother Esau comes close and asks, who is your master? Where are you going? Who owns these sheep? Answer him like this. It's your servant Jacob. They are a gift to my master Esau. Jacob is on his way. That was smart of Jacob, wasn't it? to send a little buffer zone out ahead of him because he knew Esau was going to want to kill him. So he's softening him up, and he said, put some space between the herds so Esau has a chance to see what a big gift is coming here. But Jacob stayed behind by himself. That's what we want to think about right now because he stayed behind by himself, and I can imagine him looking up in the sky and saying, this might be it. If my brother doesn't change his mind, he might kill me. And I can't spend the rest of my life running from him, so it's time for me to face it and deal with it and see what he's going to do. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Anybody know this story? So Jacob was wrestling with a man, and we say his name gets changed to Israel, which means he who wrestles with God. Charlie Cassisi wrestled with God before he got saved. And when he got saved, there was a radical transformation. Dick Smith Thank God his wife Sue didn't kill him before he got saved. <laughs> but by the grace of God, he wrestled with God and, and stayed alive long enough to realize, oh, the light, the light went on. And I'm gonna change, I'm just gonna change the course of my life. Because even though he probably wasn't doing any, anything terrible enough to get arrested and go to prison, he, there was enough sin in his life to bring that death of relationships when we don't have the sun to eclipse the death. But then once the sun comes in, everything changes. And it's not hard, really. It's not hard for us. It was hard for the Lord to live 33 years and not sin and go to that cross on our behalf. But because he did, you can have that life. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to hand in a resume, and they'll call you back and say, we'd like you to come in for an interview. You say yes to the Lord. He says yes. Come in. No strings attached. No qualification. But what's this thing about wrestling with God? Because how many people have gone through a period where you just don't understand what's happening, and you say, why, God? Why did this happen? This good person that I've been praying for, why did they die? I prayed. I was believing that they would be healed. And you're wrestling with God there, right? You're, you're trying to understand something in the natural that's beyond our comprehension. And 
you don't have an easy answer, but there's sin in the world. And when Adam and Eve sinned, that brought death. And just because we get saved doesn't mean there's not still sin in the world. It means that God gives us tools to know how to operate against that sin. And certainly for most people, it really softens our heart and helps us recognize when we do commit a sin and we want to repent of that and move forward because our goal is to be more and more like Christ every day. And since he never sinned, when we recognize that we do sin, we just say, Lord, forgive me and help me, change me. I want to bring that thing to the cross so I don't have it in my life anymore. So this is the rest of it. It says, he couldn't get the best of Jacob. That's amazing, isn't it? I heard Mario Murillo talk about this, and it said, God is, is wrestling, and of course he could just squeeze you like a grape and, and crush you. But he's not trying to win against Jacob. He's seeing how hard Jacob was willing to fight back and, and willing to say, I'm not going to leave until you bless me. That's called intercession and prayer. That's called interceding for somebody that you love and not giving up. And it's not because God's mean, but he rewards the diligent seeker. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, that God, without faith, it's impossible to believe God. But he rewards the one who diligently seeks after him. That's what he's looking for. I have any diligent seekers in the house? Yes, you should all raise your hand now by faith. Raise your hand. So he threw Jacob's hip out of joint. This is like the first little warning sign that we better bring this, we better wind this down. And the man said, let me go, it's daybreak. Jacob said, no, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. Say that. I'm not letting you go till you bless me. That's all right. That's legal. You're allowed to say that. I'm staying in this thing. I'm not giving up. I'm believing you, Lord. I believe in your promise that your word is going to come true. And the man said, what's your name? And he answered, Jacob. And the man said, no longer. Your name is no longer Jacob. From now on, it's Israel. God wrestler. <laughs> Go ahead, look at somebody and say, you're a God wrestler. And this is a compliment, okay? This is a compliment. This is not a rebellious attitude. This is saying, Lord, I'm not giving up until I get the blessing. Because I know it's true and I know it's in your word. And it's not that you are an Indian giver or that you're, you're stingy. It's just that we have to press in because there's some serious sin in the world. And if we think we're going to just take an aspirin and it's all gone, no, serious sin needs serious opposition. And I know we got some people in here that are serious about their opposition. And I've shown this video on a couple of occasions, but I was just... I wanted to have a picture for you to know that no matter how stubbornly people might be resisting the Lord, he, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God is chasing them down, fighting until they're found. Amen? He'll leave the 99 to go find that one. So just watch this, and I think you'll see um, why I want to show it to you. With me are the horse, just in case you're wondering. He called me a horse in church. That's not right. <laughs> oh no, you never let go through the calm, through the storm. Mm -hmm. Come on. How many know God's never going to let go? No matter how hard you buck him, you can't get him off your back. He loves you too much. And you're not going to let you're not going to be let go by him. So deal with it. Amen. Accept it, Lord. We accept your love tonight, and we are going to stop fighting and stop running, and we're going to run to you instead of running away from you. All right. So I'm sorry if you got offended when I called you a horse, but you, you, hopefully you get the analogy. <laughs> this is me 
Paul talking all these years ago when the Bible was written. Peter Roselli, you were once darkness. <laughs> it doesn't say you were in darkness, Peter. It says you were darkness, and I could relate and say, yeah, that's true. But now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We see this beautiful language in Luke chapter 1, which is always ris writ, uh, excuse me, read at Christmas time. This is near the end of chapter Luke, uh, 1 of Luke, but it says, A new day is dawning. This is because the Messiah is here now. And if you get a chance to look at another post we put up today on our Facebook page, it's from the chosen, and it's the shepherds. It's a scene when the shepherds are out in the field. And I'm telling you, it's a work of art. It's 25 minutes long. It's so worth watching. It's so moving that I can't do it justice to try to give you words to it. But the idea that the light has finally come into this dark world is so relevant to what we've been dealing with for the last three years, don't you think? So it says, a new day is dawn and the sunrise from the heavens will break through in our darkness. And those who huddle in night, those who sit in the shadow of death, will be able to rise and walk in the light. And one of the shepherds was crippled in this uh, scene that you'll watch if you see it. And it just completely shifts. I'll leave it at that. I don't want to ruin it for you. But we'll be guided in a pathway of peace. So earlier in Luke 1, and a lot of you would know this, so it's always good for us to just go back over what might be the basics and see what the Lord wants to show us. Because Mary is quite a heroic figure I know if you were raised in a different denomination, they might idolize her. So be careful about that. We know about that one. But she's still an amazing woman, still an amazing person that, that was willing to die. We'll see why. It says in verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and her name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. How many believe this really happened? Yes, this is not just symbolic, right? But before you were saved, did you think this really happened? <laughs> Probably not, right? This would have been part of the mythology of the, of the Christians who uh, are, are not, that they don't live in the real world. But I'm telling you, Jesus lives in the real world. And, and he's more real than the reality of the sin that's out there. So why wouldn't God, uh, you know, even, even unbelievers believe that there's a, some kind of force that's higher than, than humanity? This is, just didn't happen. So God loves us so much that he communicates. That's why he asks us to call him father. Because any good father wants to talk to their children, don't you think? Say Yes. They do. They want to talk to us. So he sends an angel on behalf of, you know, as, as an ambassador for, for heaven to speak to this young woman and say, you are highly favored. Highly favored one. Could you look at somebody and say, you are highly favored. Highly favored. Me? But if you knew the real me, you wouldn't say that. Hmm. Yes, he would. Isn't that amazing? There's a line in, in a song that we sing, you know the depths of my heart, and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. <laughs> Even though you know everything about me, you still love me unconditionally. And, and he says, this angel, Gabriel, important man in heaven, angel, blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. If, if me saying highly favored one wasn't enough, <laughs> I'm telling you right now again, you have found favor. David Torres, Tim Page, Kathleen Page, you have found favor. Come on, you need to do this. Look at somebody and say, you have found favor with God. You're still alive. <laughs> That's enough right there. I'm still breathing. That's good. Beats not breathing. Thank you, Rich. By the way, just got out of the hospital. His heart got reset. He's not in AFib anymore. Still breathing. Us old Italians, man, you can't kill us. <laughs> well, he's older than me, I'm just saying. But behold, you. <laughs> now his heart's back in AFib. Sorry, Rich. 
Just kidding. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Come on, he will be great. What do you think? Is that an understatement or what? He will be great. He'll be the only person ever born that goes through their whole life without sinning, 33 years without sinning. And because he'll be the perfect sacrifice, that will be humanity's out from hell. That will be the door people can walk through. The sacrifice of your son is going to be the way people can get out of the prison of hell and into God's kingdom, both here in the earth and for eternity. Wow. Such a deal. <laughs> He'll be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Can you say that with me too? Of his kingdom, there will be no end. Does that remind you back in Isaiah? When it says the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. The government will be upon his shoulders. Not necessarily in Washington, D.C. The government of your life. The rulership of your life. How you make your decisions is going to line up with the king of kings. To the degree that it's possible. Lord, help us to do that. Help us break that stubborn will inside of us that tries to overrule you and think that we know better, but we know you know better. And we want to put our flesh underneath that spirit that you placed inside of us, that we would be receivers of the blessing of obedience. My God, the wages of sin is death, but the blessings of obedience is eternal life. And so many, so many earthly blessings by just doing it his way, my God. Can't even put a price on it. He'll reign over the house of Jacob, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Whether you like it or not, this is true. <laughs> I heard a preacher say one time, what if, what if you went up to people that don't believe in the Lord and say, do you know that your spirit is going to live forever and there's nothing you can do about it? That's true. So if you know that's true, which side do you want to be on here? I think I would rather choose God's side because the, the, the fruit is a whole lot better than the wages of sin being death. The gift of God is life eternal. And I can't even control the fact that I'm not just a physical body, but I'm a spirit that's going to live forever. I choose to live with God in, in eternity. Not because I'm great or smarter than anybody else. I had to humble myself just like everybody else here that's a Christian and say, I can't do it in my own strength. I have to do it in his strength, or I'm in big trouble. Then Mary said to the angel, how could this be, since I don't know a man? And then this wonderful truth comes in that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and I know I'm asking you to do this a lot tonight, but look at somebody and say, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That is really good news. <laughs> Wow, that is really good news that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. People in the Old Testament only had it happen once in a while. But God said, in the last days, I will pour my spirit on all flesh. But pastor, what if there's a Christ somebody here who's not a Christian? I can't say that the Holy Spirit's upon them, can I? I'll wait. He said, I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Not just all Christian flesh. So maybe part of what happens when you're not a believer, when you get convicted, is there is a stirring on the inside because there is an aspect. Every person is created in the image of God. And we are in those days when the Spirit has been poured out. So maybe you don't have to be the one to try to come up with the best solution. Maybe it's already in there. And if you just make a way for them to know that he's real and the relationship is real, maybe it's not as hard as we think to help people realize it. Because once they taste and see that the Lord is good, they don't want to go back to the counterfeit anymore. Amen? Amen? There's no comparison. The Holy Spirit, Mary, will come upon you, but also everybody sitting here tonight, that is the game changer. Yes, salvation, the cross, was super important because you can't resurrect from the dead unless you die. But without the resurrection, the cross wouldn't have meant anything, Paul said. And the resurrection not only brought him life, it brought us life. He took the keys of death and hell and conquered the power of that. Where is your sting, death? Hmm. What are you doing over there? Oh, I thought that was Nate. I thought he got transferred. <laughs> 
and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the one, holy one, who is to be born will be called, come on, the son of God. Who was the first son of God? Adam. Jesus was the last. And now we are the sons and daughters of the living king. Amen. Isn't it amazing? 1 Corinthians 15, we'll go through that whole comparison. The first Adam and the last Adam. Amazing. Amazing, Lord, that you would do all of that for us. And all we have to do is engage with it and make the decision not to go the other way. Love it. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, this is also really good news. Elizabeth, your relative, who also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. Has anybody experienced barrenness being broken off your life since you became a Christian? Yes, very much so. That's what's supposed to happen. That's the fruit of the Spirit of God living inside of us is barrenness is broken off of us. Vision comes back. Dreams come back. That, that dark cloud that was hanging over us of depression gets lifted because we now have a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us, I have a plan for you, and it's a good plan to prosper. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be unto me according to your word, Lord. We say the same thing. Let it be unto us according to your word. Let us be obedient people that receive the blessing of obedience to you, Lord. Not the easy way out. And the angel departed from her. This was what uh, a commentator said about what I'm about to read to you about Mary's response to all of this that just happened. She's a young girl, certainly still a teenager, and could easily be stoned uh, for the sin of adultery, right? Because if she's pregnant and she hasn't been with a man, that's, that's worthy of death. And yet she still says, by faith, let it be unto me according to your word. I've got enough faith to believe you that however you're going to do it, it's going to work out. God blesses that obedience. Mary's response can't even be contained in normal prose. Her soul overflows in poetry. It isn't just simply religious. It has a powerful social and political overtone. So if you don't think that we should be involved in deciding who gets on the school boards, you've been deceived. Because we care about our children. Do you? Yes, so who's teaching our children really matters. So the idea that Christians shouldn't get involved in the culture is just a complete deception of the enemy, right? Well, if you're just going to turn them over and hope that it works out well, hope is not a good strategy when it comes to the culture. So there's, there's political overtones because they're talking about a new king. It speaks of a great reversal, what might be called a social, economic, and political revolution. To people in Mary's day, there's little question as to what she's talking about. The Jewish people are oppressed by the Romans to speak of a king who will demote the powerful and rich and elevate the poor and humble means just one thing, that God is moving, come on, towards setting them free. Setting each heart free. And you might have heard the quote that says, the line between good and evil runs right down the center of every human being's heart. That was Solzhenitsyn when he was in the prison camp, the Gulag Archipelago, and he was witnessing hell, and he wasn't a believer, and he became a believer watching the Christians that were in the prison camp ready to die, and they had something that he knew he did not have. And now all of a sudden, this is the division between good and evil right here. And every, this is where the revolution happens with Christ. It starts in our heart. We humble ourselves. We repent. We recognize my life is not as, as good as it could be, Lord. And the only way it's going to change is if you come in and you take the wheel. And I'll listen. And that's not weak. That's the best thing you could ever do. Setting them free. So in verse 46, it says, the song that we sing sometimes, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. Remember that one? And my spirit exalts in God my Savior. That's, this is where that song comes from. And in the voice it says, my soul lifts up to the Lord. My spirit celebrates God, my liberator. For though I'm God's humble servant, God has noticed me. How about you? Did he notice you? Luke? God noticed you? You think? You're his favorite. So are you. <laughs> He's big enough to have more than one favorite. 
You're his favorite, Dave. So's your son. All your kids. When, when, his little, when your little daughter comes running out of here and she goes to her mom, brings her in, and then she runs running to daddy. Daddy, daddy. Like if you ever needed a picture of God's love, bam, like it happens right in front of you. Amazing. God has noticed me, Mary. Now and forever I'll be considered blessed by all generations. For the mighty one has done great things for me. How about you? Yeah, I'm getting a witness here. Mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is God's name. From generation to generation, God's loving kindness endures for those who will revere him. God's arm has accomplished mighty deeds. What are the mighty deeds? He took people that were broken by the world and restored them and turned them into leaders. It's amazing what he can do with a broken person. The proud in mind and heart, God has sent away in disarray. The rulers from their high positions of power, God has brought down low. And those who were humble and lowly, God has elevated with dignity. She's being one of those right now, isn't she? The hungry, God has filled with food. The rich, God has dismissed with nothing in their hands. To Israel, God's servant, God has given help as promised to our ancestors, remembering Abraham and his descendants in mercy forever. And the longer I've been Christian now, it's 40 years since I uh, accepted the Lord. It will be 40 on January 1st of this year. The, the more profound the understanding of the generation to generational blessing that happens in the Lord and how we're standing on the shoulders of great men and women, even including in our own life, as, as Eddie Cooney was saying, the different speakers that come through here. These are all kind of a reward, in, in my opinion, of just being faithful and, and building relationships that my wife mostly is responsible for building these relationships and then being in fellowship with people that iron sharpens iron. And you don't get satisfied and you don't level off and, and you don't hit a plateau where you stop growing. You never have to stop growing in the Lord. It's amazing. And I don't plan to stop. I don't know about you, but I'm going to keep on growing and going. Zechariah prophesied also in this chapter over his son. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but here's a man who took an opposite approach when Gabriel came to him. Now, he was a priest, and I would say Mary being a teenager versus Zechariah being a priest there's, a priest, there's different expectations. So he said, how can this be? And the angel said, well, you know what? You know, you're the one who prayed for this. You're the priest. So you're going to have a timeout for the next nine months because you're going to get a baby, and when, when the baby's born, you'll... You can come out of your time out. But look at what he says. You, my son, John the Baptist, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will be the one to prepare the way for the Lord. Anybody here got that anointing on your life? Raise your hand, please. Yes, we all are people who prepare the way for the Lord. That's the ministry of Elisha. That's what they were asking. Jesus, I thought, I thought Elijah had to come. Well, if you'll, if you'll receive it, John the Baptist had that spirit. That's what he's doing. He's that prophet. That's who we are. We're the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. It's not as bad as it looks. You can turn to God, and there's a way out of this mess. He makes the crooked way straight, right? So that the Lord's people will receive knowledge of their freedom through the forgiveness of sins. Now, there's that, there's that loop right there. I can get my freedom by asking for forgiveness of my sins, by repenting and saying, I recognize I'm not getting an A on all the tests here, Lord. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing good in some ways. I'm, I'm not as evil as Hitler, but I'm probably not up there with, uh, you know, uh, whoever you consider a great Christian, Trisha Roselli. I'm somewhere in the middle here. I'm a good person. Anybody ever say that? I'm good. I haven't killed anybody this week. But all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? Like the, the, the mark is set high. So the only way is to say, just to acknowledge it and say, yeah, I mean, I, I'm only going to get freedom through the forgiveness of my sins. And I can't save myself. So I have to make a bargain and say, I'm willing to let go of that old life because the benefits of serving you far outweigh the pleasures of sin for a season. The fleeting pleasure of sin, right? We all know that one. And 78 says, all this will flow from the kind and compassionate mercy of our God, which is wonderful to think about. His kindness will lead us to repentance. 
but he has a standard that he wants us to live up to. Amen? Amen? Yes, there's a standard he wants us to live up to. We can't water down the truth of the word of God. We have to stand on the truth. And if sin is involved, we have to identify it as sin. I'm sure glad somebody did that in my life. How about you? There's no way you can live in right relationship with God if you're intentionally doing something that's against what he's asking us to do. We all do things unintentionally that we can realize afterwards and, and acknowledge and repent. But I want, I want to have knowledge that shows me where the sin is and I can get to the root of it and, and, and eliminate it because that's my goal, to be like Jesus who didn't sin. Amen? And this is some people are on a dark spiral downward. Romans chapter 2 in the message, verse 1. But if you think that leaves you <laughs> on the high ground where you can point your finger at others, think again. <laughs> Don't you love the message? That's what Easter used to say when she came here. That's real. Keep it real. <laughs> That's the message. If you think because you're a Christian, you can stand up on your mountain and point down at everybody else, think again. We should be the humblest people because we're aware of who we serve. And we're going to keep trying to be like him, but we never fully get there in this life. But we can sure try. Amen? This is how it says it. I'm almost done. I know you probably want to get going here. Judgmental criticism of others is a well-known way of escaping detection of your own crimes and misdemeanors. <laughs> right? You see what he's saying? Create a diversion. Make, them, they make everybody look at that person, and then they won't be looking at me. Bait somebody into saying something, and that will change the subject of the real topic to your response to the topic when you blew your Italian temper. And now they're not even talking about the original thing. They're talking about how badly you responded. No, because we, we have Holy Spirit in us. We have the Word in us. We can control that if we try. Holy Spirit says the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. You don't have to give in to those emotions anymore if you're walking in line with the Father. But God isn't so easily diverted, okay? You might create a diversion to fool some of the people, but you're not fooling God. <laughs> he sees right through all such smoke screens and holds you to what you've done. Do you think that by pointing your finger at others that you would distract God from seeing your own misgivings? Peter, no. That's my answer. Do you think that because he's such a nice God, he let you off the hook? What's the answer, Manny? Forgiveness is one thing, but we also have to recognize there's consequences to bad decisions. So if we're thinking that we can live whatever we want to do and then not have to pay the penalty of, of whatever that thing was, it's not death typically, but there are bad consequences to making bad decisions. So grace is there to forgive us, but it doesn't excuse what happened. We still have to face those consequences. That's all he's saying here. Better think this one through again from the beginning. Let's stand. I just want you to know I'm driving towards something here that the good news is, as dark as the world is, the sun eclipses the darkness. If you could think of it that way, that helps me so much this week as I was thinking about what to say tonight. That as bad as it might be and as confusing as it might be and how, whatever thing you watch on YouTube or Rumble that makes your blood boil, that gets you so angry, doesn't compare to the glory that we're going to have. I mean, I'm not saying don't get involved and don't know what's going on. You should know what's going on. But keep it in perspective here, right? Because start right here. <laughs> start in the mirror. That's the best place you can do it. Before you start judging everybody else, just look in, in the mirror and say, how can I be more like you, Lord, today, tomorrow, the next day, more than I was like you yesterday? And then reflect back, because here's where it goes. It says, we have to think this one through from the beginning. God is kind, but he's not soft. In kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into a radical life change. There's no discipleship without radical life change. 
Jesus didn't say, go ye into all the world and make converts. He said, go ye into all the world and make disciples. Big difference between somebody saying a prayer and somebody living radically sold out to God and every day wanting to be more and more like him. There's no better path in life. I don't care what your career is. Any career is going to be better off if that's your goal, to be more like Christ. So there's no downside other than you lose your depression, you lose the consequences of sin, you lose the confusion of lying so often you can't keep track of all your lies. And, you know, like, I'm not picking on them, but, well, no, I won't even say it. I did such stupid things when I was high. It's one thing to be high, you could get in a car accident, but the decisions you make are ridiculous. So you can't remember all the lies, so eventually your sin finds you out. Let go of that stuff. Let go of it and just say, look, I'm going to try another, another way. Trisha said this. I said this. It's like, look. Nothing I'm doing is working, so I want to try what, what you're offering me based on all these people telling me that this works. I'll give it a try because I'm in a bad place. Now, don't wait till you get to the bad place to try it. In kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into a radical life change. Has anybody here had a radical life change in Christ? Oh, my God, the best thing that ever happened, the best choice you could ever make. And to be in a congregation of people who will help you walk through it is, 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 is gold. That's all I can tell you. It's gold. Because trying to do it on your own, it can be done. But why? Why would you do it alone? We need each other. And then this is what it says in the voice, same verse. But I'm going to end. This is the last verse. His kindness is guiding our hearts to turn away from distractions and habitual sin to walk a new path of repentance. Amen? So that's, that's, that's the goal tonight. As we're, as we're celebrating Christmas over the next couple of days, as we're with family, as we're with loved ones, we start here. We start, say, Lord, use me to reflect your character, to reflect your nature. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be a judgmental, pharisaical person, a legalist. I want to, I want to demonstrate the true love of God. What you said to people over and over again, is that it wasn't that they were, there was anything inertly, innately wrong with them. It was the sin in their life that needed to go. And once that is lifted off of our lives, once we get that spirit of God on the inside of us, we don't want to sin any longer. The want to goes away because your love replaces it. So I say that for every one of us here today, Lord, that, that your love would replace any, any desires of our heart that don't line up with your perfect will for us. And that you would cleanse us and renew us. But more than that, Lord, help us to reflect what you put inside of, of us, your heart towards other people. Family, friends, people on the job, people we come in contact with in any situation. Lord, we pray that they would be drawn to you through us. And I just bless anybody here that's questioning right now whether they should be the one to say, yeah, I want to try this. I'm, I'm tired of running away from God. I want to run towards God. That could be you. If you're in the room, if you're watching online, that could be you. It was me. It was everybody else that's here in this place today. And anybody that you know that's a Christian, they had to come to a place and say, you know what? My way isn't working. I want to try it God's way. So we're just going to say a prayer. It's not complicated. So it's like talking to somebody that you love and say, Lord, I'm going to talk to you like another person, right? That's called prayer. So let's pray it out loud together. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I recognize there's sin in my life and there's a punishment for sin. So I need to be saved from that punishment, but I can't save myself. So I need your help. I need Jesus' sacrifice to stand in the gap for my sin. Thank you, Lord, that you were willing to be a sacrifice for my sin. And now I ask you to come in and take the reins of my life. I surrender my will to your will. Fill me with your spirit. Open my eyes 
to see the truth of your word. I accept you as my Lord and Savior for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's the best prayer you could ever say right there. And maybe somebody in here said it tonight. If you did, that's amazing. The Bible says that anytime a sinner turns and that there's a celebration in heaven and your name gets written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So you can remember December 23rd, 2022 as the day that your name got written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the privilege that we would have right now, if that was you that said it, would be to pray with you and say, welcome into the kingdom. Can we do that by faith, church? Can we welcome anybody who said yes to that prayer? Can we welcome them into the kingdom? Come on, give them a hand by faith and say yes. Best decision that you could ever make. Say yes to Jesus. If it's you watching, contact us. If it's anybody here in this room and you're willing to say, yeah, that was me. I said that prayer tonight for the first time and I want to learn more about what you're talking about because I need him. I need his help. Come on, raise your hand. You won't be alone in this. You'll be, you'll be guided every step of the way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in the hearts of your people. We celebrate right now for the yes and amen of Jesus, but also for the yes and amen of your people. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. I'm believing by faith. I saw somebody raise a hand, and I'm believing by faith that that was an answer prayer. So I just want to bless you all. I'm sorry we won't see you on Sunday, but that's, that's the decision that we made. Our next service will be here on Wednesday night at 7. I think we have people willing to pray right now. That will be up here. Uh, if you have a prayer that you'd like us to join in with, come on up that aisle. There will be a prayer ministry team here at the altar. Otherwise, say it out loud with me. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Celebrate your life in God. Love you all. Have a great night.